Glad you guys all enjoyed the film. It is my pleasure right now to introduce to the stage Jocelyn DeBoer and Don Lube. Well, hi, everybody. We're so happy to be here. Yes. I'm Jocelyn. I'm Dawn. Um, Longtime members of SAG. Woo! Yay! Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about the tone of the movie because it's so specific and it's the first thing that grabs you from the very first moment that we see both of your characters on screen and kind of what point when you were writing it you realized that that was the overall tone and feel that you wanted for the entire movie. Oh, thank you um, for saying that. Yeah, when we were writing the feature, tone was one of the biggest things we were constantly discussing. Uh, I want to say it's we ha definitely had an idea of what we thought the tone was, and we could tell because certain things would just feel so right in the writing, and then certain things in our guts didn't feel right. And it, it's really like we are the calibration. Yeah for the tone and um, we knew that and we could feel it, I think. And I yeah. think with um, with a movie where so many absurd things happen, it was so important to us that, um, to the characters and, and everything, to the actors, everything was grounded and there was a certain amount of subtlety in that this just is their world yeah. where these things happen. So um, yeah, it was, we. It, but it is uh, a hard balance to strike with, with comedy, especially of, um, you know, playing it at, at the right tone. Yeah. yeah, it's all a balance of tension and release. And um, it truly, it's, I feel like we would have the tone right sometimes on set and then we'd see it in the edit and it didn't feel right. And then our editor, we'd work with him to fix it. And um, the music is a huge part of establishing the tone as well. So always the conversation and truly key to a movie like this, I think. So I'm glad you asked him about it. <laughs> and since you developed it from a short film that had had such a successful run on the festival, circuit what was important for you to keep from the short film and kind of what elements did you kind of take more as a learning curve that you wanted to grow and expand upon story-wise you, you know it's funny we um, after making the short film uh, about a year after it was on the festival circuit we sold it as a television show to IFC and we developed that for about five to six months working on the pilot and I want to say through that process the story became so much larger and it was just this incredibly ambitious world and it, it didn't end up working at IFC at that moment with I think the budget we demanded and what was going on but um, it, what was nice about making it a feature is that then we were able to take this huge concept and focus in on basically one like a more simple story and so uh, once we were working on the feature drafts we it was still kind of complicated and we were like we don't want this to be too plotty because this is a satire and there's so many like, themes that we want to work and the layers of the comedy um and plot was kind of getting in the way and then we had this one day i want to say about a month before we actually finished our shooting script where we were like should we watch the short film it was like over yeah. breakfast one day we hadn't seen it in at least a year maybe yeah. longer and yeah, we went to watch it and we're like, this is so simple. Yeah. And um, that really like gave us confidence to just like really slim down. And it also, I think, really follow like what was making us laugh. In, in, in the rewrites that happened after it, there was certain th scenes that we had been working on and working on that just like had gotten to a point where we weren't, they weren't like bringing us joy anymore. And, and so, it was easy to just kind of be like, well, that can go. And, yeah. Yeah. I'm also really interested in your relationship with your other producers. I know that you had Natalie Metzger, and she's also worked on other shorts that have become features like Thunder Road. So kind of how did she help to guide that transition into a narrative feature for you both? Oh, well, it's, uh, it's actually funny. Natalie... Uh, once we got Natalie on board, we were just rocking and rolling because she is such a machine. We can't say enough uh, great things about the kind of producer Natalie Metzger is. And I mean, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, we had originally met Natalie um, through, she produced uh, the short film Thunder Road, which was um, playing at um, South by Southwest in competition with the Greener Grass short, and we just loved it. And we like, tracked down Jim Cummings, the director, at a party, and we were, you know, 
just gushed to him. And a few months later, we were directing a short film that, and we were like, you know what? We or we had like a low budget, and we we're like, Thunder Road, the short looked so incredible, and it was a low budget. We got to find out who that producer was. So we emailed Jim, and you know he put us in touch with Natalie, uh, who just from. The second we met her, where it was a, a match made in heaven, and, and then, yeah, it's true with the future. We I think we did twenty one page one rewrite drafts from January twenty eighteen to the end of May twenty eighteen when we first showed the draft to Natalie and Donna and I. I want to say are so kind of. Um, we're perfectionists and can be almost too obsessive about the, having the script perfect. And so what was a gift to us when we met Natalie, we kind of took her out to dinner and we're like, we just want you to read this script. We're interested in you producing it. We're still working on it. And she was like, girls, Sundance deadline is coming up, like whenever it was, August. And she was like, we need to get into pre-production next week or we're never going to be considered for Sundance. And we were like, oh, we'll read it first. <laughs> I don't know um, about Sundance. Uh, but she, I think with Thunder Road, the feature version that she produced, they of course had an incredible uh, festival run, but they were just a few weeks shy of being able to premiere at Sundance time-wise. And hell if that was going to happen to Natalie again so um, so it was really uh, having her on board as a producer really put a fire under our bellies yeah. um, but we want to say about Sundance too I don't know I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys are filmmakers or have applied or whatever in some ways that it's we always feel like oh it, it probably looks like our first feature premiered at Sundance and that seems so easy um, but we like to say that we got rejected by Sundance four times before they accepted our feature film so yeah, we had three short films we made, all really nice rejection letters that yes. we got, and uh -huh. then we uh, applied to the feature labs with a different feature script. We busted our asses like writing this feature. Yeah, and, and it got rejected. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> what we like to say about that though is that we were kind of telling Natalie like, I don't think Sundance is for us. Like, they, I just we don't think like they you know get our comedy and. Um, but then the feature did end up getting in, which is a miracle to us. And uh, what was funny is that the first night we got there, we went to like the filmmakers welcome party and these two Sundance programmers came running up to us and they were like, greener grass, like we have been following you two for years and we love your short films and like we've been tracking you. We were like, you have? <laughs> we thought you didn't like us. Um, yeah. in the when we got the call that we, we got, did say that did, that's true yeah. <laughs> when, when we got the call that we got in Sundance it was um, by this programmer named Dilcia and she had always written us these nice rejection letters for our shorts and she said you uh, I have been a shorts programmer for years and I was recently promoted to a features programmer and I was I have always fought for you guys, and I love your work. She was like, it did and not work out with the show. It didn't work out, <laughs> and now I've promoted, and you guys are coming to Sundance. Yeah. You never know, like, the who, you know, you never yeah. know. One of the other relationships that you guys built on the festival circuit that I thought was really interesting was Janixa Bravo, who is an amazing filmmaker, and I think also makes very quirky, very specific toned films. Uh, I think it was Lemon that she had when you guys met her, and then you cast her in this as well. So I was curious if there was any advice or anything that you learned from just being around her that came into play when making this. Well, we actually met Janixa that same year at South By um, when our, our Greener Grass short was there, because she had a short there too. So I think one of the things that was so inspiring to us about watching Janix's career is she I think was the first I want to say the first of us before Jim Cummings and before us made a feature yeah. uh, and I, I think we were watching how she did it and we we're like oh I wonder if we could do that yeah. uh, but it, it's true she has such a formalist style and uh, just pays so much attention to every single detail of her frame and mm -hmm. we you know also aspire to do that of course and, yeah. Yeah. Such an incredible eye in her edit for for comedic timing and the way um, awkwardness plays out in 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 her comed in her comedy is just so admirable and cool. I, I, I don't know if you said she plays Marriott, our friend who's always in the sports uniforms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I'm also really curious at what point you knew that you definitely wanted to direct the feature because you actually didn't direct the short. 
Yeah, absolutely. So Don and I met on a sketch team performing at the Bright Citizens Brigade here in New York. That uh, was such a tight knit sketch team. And on our team was this uh, great director, Paul Briganti, who's a friend of ours who had directed college humor videos forever. And then um, now he's the digital video director at Saturday Night Live. And so it, when we thought of the Greener Grass short, it was really like we thought of it over lunch one day. We were like, we can shoot something simple in a backyard. Like it's just two soccer moms. And um, we kind of pitched it to him at a party that night. Like, do you want to direct it? We'll make it next weekend. <laughs> it was like this really um, kind of casual thing. And, and he did direct it and I think added so much to it. And uh, we, and then basically he delivered, I think about a week after we finished shooting, a director's cut of the assembly, and then he got hired at SNL and he had to move to New York. And so Don and I had, we didn't know much about directing at all, and we ended up being in the edit for our film, which there is no better way to learn filmmaking, we think, than sitting in an edit, because you truly learn exactly what you need and should have put in your script, so you should, <laughs> should have shot it. And so, uh, yeah, but and through that process of working with the composer, working, being in the sound mix, working with the colors, doing all that, we really, we're like, oh, we love do, like having our hands in all of these elements. And, and before that, we had um, done mostly acting and where you aren't involved in post usually. And, um, and so that was, I think, our first glimpse into like really being excited about directing and learning about directing and seeing that as something we could potentially do. And then we made another short film um, really shortly after our first one where we also had an Upright Citizens Brigade friend and director, Mitch McKee, direct it. But with Mitch, we kind of told him from the beginning, like, we, we want to kind of shadow you. And he was so wonderful about incorporating us and making the shot lists and kind of approving props and like the pre-production stuff that we hadn't really done with Paul. And um, by the time we were, I guess, like done with Buzz, we were like, oh, I think we got this. I think we can do this, which was such an incredible thing for us to learn because I, th I think like everyone, like we would have imposter syndrome at times and maybe have fantasies even like about directing uh, when we were acting in New York. But we were like, well, we don't, we didn't go to film school. We both love movies, but neither of us are like cinephiles and, you know, encyclopedias of, you know, cinema knowledge, which I feel like some directors really are and, and I just thought well I don't know about lenses how yeah. can I ever direct and you can learn about lenses it's true <laughs> and like you just do learn it because when when you're on set it's uh, you have to and um, the, so I don't know uh, not that you guys need to be directors but um, that was exciting yeah. for us to learn that we we're passionate yeah about that. but also one of the most important skill sets that you can bring as actors as well is knowing how to work with your cast on set which brings me to my next question about your casting process process and how you wanted to create the tone in the room when people were walking in because you know what that feels like on the other side. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we've both been on that other side of, you know, the, the table so many times and yeah. I, I think it was so important to us when people, when actors walked in that they felt like comfortable and that we were, like we we so valued their time and their being there and there's so much was, preparation yeah. that goes into an audition when you're an actor and I just like have so much respect for and want to show that we like so respect their time. We like so furiously d you, yeah don't want to waste actors times and and I think for that reason we did audition few people we we did kind of uh on camera like one short scene basically, because we're like, you really know after the first, like, I don't know, a few lines. If There's no need to make an actor put 15 pages on tape. It's evil. <laughs> and then if you like them after that first half page, bring them in and meet them in person. But this is what we think. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's a, it's very it's really interesting to be on the other side of the table. I'm sure you guys have heard people talk about this so much, but it really is true that um, there's so much that goes into the casting that's not just the strongest audition, and it's I think. Uh, 
for us in particularly, we we so would gravitate towards people that we knew. And because we have the, a big community and we've known a lot of actors forever, I, I, I guess if I'm just being honest, it's like we would have one like really great performer that we don't know at all and then an equally great performer that we've been fans of forever and it, it is like you want to cast the person that you know. So I don't know if that's true for everyone, but I, find, I think that was in our conversation sometimes. One, th one thing that was interesting with the, or like with the character of the photographer I'm thinking of, we had that... I feel like when we wrote that and when we talked about that character, it was this really kind of gruff, like bearded, like aggro kind of man, not aggro, but like the, the type of character it was, was so in our heads is completely different than John Milheiser who plays that character. And he walked in and had such a unique, different reading of the script that where the lines he said surprised me. I'm like, oh, that is the lines but that's not how we've always said it and he did this like very subtle interesting physical comedy uh he, like, kept peeking behind a curtain that wasn't in the script at all yeah, yeah. and he left and we we're like well he has like we were just like that's it that is not at all the part like we had in our head yeah. but like i just like to say that because i think sometimes like as an actor like I'll get a part and I'm like, well, this isn't my type at all. You and get then, discouraged like, and kind of like, why do they call me in? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, but it did just happen to Dawn, I will say too, where she was putting herself on tape for something and I was asking her like, oh, what is it? And she's like, oh, I can't, like, it basically the character description is built like a Mack truck. Yeah, and like she's like, extremely <laughs> muscular, like huge woman. And I'm like, it was for an arm wrestling movie. And I'm yeah. like, this is, is this a mistake? Like, why yeah, was I sent this? But and, and we had, like, the woman who plays the serial killer in our movie, Dot Jones, is, like, a former, like, 17-time world championship arm wrestler. Built like, like a Mack truck. wanted to write the director and be like, you should just offer this to Dot Jones. Yeah. I mean, but I, like, threw down a, a tape. And, and like, she got the part. And <laughs> yeah. Happened. But so it's just, I don't know, that rarely has happened. But, like, yeah. you just never know, I think, yeah. sometimes. Of course, this is... Yeah. Well, congrats on getting that role. That's amazing. <laughs> um, I'm also interested if you had conversations amongst the two of you of kind of what you wanted your rhythm on set to be, especially in terms of giving notes to actors as co-directors. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We're, uh, we feel so um, protective of actors' emotional energy. And it's, uh, I think one of the greatest gifts actors who direct have is that we've all been on so many different sets and you get to observe the feeling on sets and what it feels like to be talked to in different ways, et cetera. And what the two of us had worked with um, a directing pair kind of a few times and the, they kind of made us tense <laughs> because it, you would sometimes hear diff, you know, you would hear them kind of argue about something and then you'd get like competing notes and we we're so diligent about never wanting to do that. Um, yeah, so we would really touch base with each other before talking to an actor or even like if if Jocelyn for example wanted an actor to try things one way and we do that and then maybe I might want to get an alt of a different way but we were very careful to never be like telling them two different things before a take yeah and also we would uh, you, of course we're starring in the movie too so it's a bit of a unique dynamic that way but we talked about beforehand that we wanted it to be that the actor we're acting opposite of is getting the direction from the person who's not in the scene so I'm not like you know kissing back about it and then breaking to be like next time can you kind of do this thing and, um, but I, I will kind of go over to the monitor and just like you know whisper to Dawn, like, let's have him try this one, and then let her do the coaching. Um, so yeah, we kind of, were, yeah, we yeah. were very aware of that. I also feel like you wrote some unique challenges into your script in the form of 
babies, children, and dogs. So I was curious <laughs> at what point sure. you started to think about the reality of what that was going to be like on set. Oh my gosh. And it, like you, every adult had to have braces on their teeth. Can't ever show naked teeth. Um, no cars in the movie. An extremely controlled color palette to the point of like no red, no black, other than like really unique uh, like times. So, so yes. Um, yeah, I don't know why we decided to do that. <laughs> but, um, we do have like, we, with the babies, we've worked with babies a lot. I don't know why we keep writing them and things, but um, we, we have this little trick we've done, which is we cast babies from large families. Yeah, the youngest children in very large families are the chillest babies. Yeah, I think yeah. they're used to chaos going on around them. They're used yeah. to being passed around, like yeah. sleeping while people are screaming. Like, yeah. so that, and th those babies, it was twins that were from a big family and they were like the most like chill actors on set. Yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. One of the things I love the most about watching the film visually is, is that color palette that you mentioned. And it's so specific from the costumes to the production design. What were the challenges of putting that together on an independent film budget, though? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's exactly what you were thinking. Uh, but we uh, all credit for actually making our insanely ambitious vision happen goes to Lee Poindexter and Lauren Oppel for really uh, doing the on the ground work. Um, so Lee Poindexter is our production designer and Lauren Oppel is our costume designer. Yeah. And uh, of course we had like not large budgets for for either thing, but with the costumes, for example, a lot of them were things that came from Goodwill or Walmart, but then Lauren was constantly on set with a sewing machine, so every single piece of clothing had what we call rick-rack on it, little pom-poms and, and squiggles, and the so that it looks, you know, perhaps more custom than it, than it, it cost. Um, but yeah, we, it, it was, it, these characters too care so much about like their identity is so much about like what's on the outside not what's like going on in the inside and um so those little details too just like help with that it's something we talked about with our designers like wanting it to be that this is where the characters put their focus but it was our designer lauren who came up with the idea of doing the rick rack um just to give that extra added punch to like how how very much the energy is put into the outside, not the inside. <laughs> yeah. Also, kind of going back to the, the tone of the comedy a little bit, one of the things that I found really interesting was that you originally premiered the short in France and kind of seeing that reaction that it had with audiences and I think a lot of teenage girls came up to you right after that really loved it. Did it make you try to think about ensuring that when you're writing the feature and putting this together that it was really comedy that was going to resonate across a wide breadth of audiences differently? So much. Yeah. We always were like, will the French teenagers like this? <laughs> we felt so indebted to them for making us feel so great in France. Uh, but it's it's true. I think like we would talk about it um, kind of in terms of while we were writing and kind of like Don was saying before, like when we would get a little frustrated with the scene and feeling like it wasn't fun, we would try to pump ourselves up to make it better by being like, we just want to make a movie that like the young versions of ourselves when we were first discovering like, cinema would just think like absolutely rocks. Like that's what, like we so remember, like in a sea of movies where so many things are the same, we so remember movies like Welcome to the Dollhouse or even I feel like Napoleon Dynamite was one that was just like so different from comedies that I had seen when that came out. And it just like expands your mind and it's like so exciting. And I, we did talk about like, wouldn't it be cool if we made something like that? Yeah. And I think one thing, Jocelyn and I both grew up in the Midwest mm -hmm. and we so it's so important to us to like get our movie to the Midwest oh, yeah. because I feel like I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska that had like so few cultural like opportunities and I so so clearly remember like the few times like an actor a director or designer from New York would come to like Lincoln and 
I don't know. That that's just a weird tangent. But it's true. Like right. those are the people that like. And yeah, no, it's not. Well, really, we're like joking around this week because, of course, our movie's coming out in New York and LA. But like every ticket that sold helps our chances of being in Minnesota. And <laughs> so we're like, please come, New York. Please. Be good. Yeah, Midwest, yeah. <laughs> I love it so much. It definitely taps into that. And how did you kind of think about the way that you wanted to approach the, the horror elements? Because I think what's so great about that is that it's really actually just the reality of everyday life in their society that's what's frightening. It's not trying to make audiences jump out of their seats or anything like that. Yeah. It's, it was so fun for us to do a meld of horror and comedy because we found that when we were exploring, the, you know, the, those tones, there, there's so much similarity. And comedy, it's, it's all about timing. And, you know, same, same with horror. It's all about tension and managing tension and release and timing. And so I think the two wove together in a way that we found so exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah. In in just in terms of like in the script writing phase too, we were s interested in a world in which there's a serial killer on the loose and yet the bigger threat is your friend that you're sitting next to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when you're sitting writing the script together, did you have any sort of particular method or process that you had for working collaboratively together and seeing if scenes were working, like reading them back and forth to each other? Yeah, I would say for me too, just one of like the very basic things that Don and I do that kind of changed my life in terms of um, being productive is we we work every day. Like I want to say nine to five, but it's often like 8.30 to 6.30 and it is like our job. It, for a long time we were going to one of our houses and it was like you show up on time and we had an hour lunch break and we did we do something called deep work which means we work for an hour and a half that's timed with no internet no phones like nothing can be on and then you get a snack <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we love our snacks and we really talk about them and look forward to them in a way that is strange for adults yeah but <laughs> It's funny, I feel like sometimes like my sister will be like, well, why can't you come to this? Just like you, like, especially before we were really producing things. We're like, you don't have a job. And I was like, we do have a job. <laughs> like this, and that's the only way we were able to write 21 drafts in six months is yeah. just treating it like work. So that's one big thing for yeah. us, yeah. Yeah, and it, we're always interested to talk to like other writing teams and stuff because I think a, a lot of, teams work together differently and you know some people do a draft pass it to their partner they do a draft or what you know split up scenes and I admire that and I wish we could do that because it would probably be so much faster but <laughs> we truly do every single bit of the writing together sitting next to each other with like our screens in front of us a shared document and it's, yeah I can't see for myself, like comedy writing happening a different way, really, because, it, you know, we both cut our teeth doing live performance, like just years and years of improv. And the humor only gets to where it gets because of everyone involved. It's like the riffing is the most important part of it, like taking something farther than you could imagine just by yourself taking it. So it's it's so true that I'll think I come up with something so funny and then I like read it out loud and then Don like takes it and puts a twist on it and makes it better and then that gives me an idea and that's so much of how we uh, you know get to the comedy place that is insane. <laughs> And when it came point to actually walking on set for your performances, did you find that you didn't really have to do much prep because you'd kind of already done it through the writing process, so it's very different to when you're going onto someone else's set? It is so different. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think normally, of course, so much of your job as an actor is um, analyzing the script and really trying to figure out the, the motivations and the relationships between each character. and. It was such a, of course, advantage to have written it and just like know that inside and, and out. Um, yeah, and then, yeah, it really did make things, the prep a little bit less. <laughs> and now that you're kind of on the other side of the film and it's out in the world, what aspect are you proudest of achieving through the film? Oh, that's a nice question. 
really glad we got it done. <laughs> I know, there were some dark days. <laughs> um, I, I guess, like, I feel like there's very few things that, like, I've created that where I was like, well, this is my voice and my sense of humor, and this, this movie is, like, so our voice. And, you know, whether people like it or they don't or whatever, it's just, like, I'm so happy that there's something out there that... <laughs> Um, I feel like excited about yeah and it's and I think like we are only able to make it the way that uh, we are proud of and still think is funny and everything because we uh, like had the blessing I guess of having the incredible team that we had and you guys know filmmaking is a team sport you know from the your key designers to your PAs and the team behind Greener Grass just was so passionate and worked so incredibly hard during very rough circumstances with our low budget that we feel so uh, proud that as a team we are all able to make this movie happen and we also really hope for our next one we have a better budget so we can give back to those people. <laughs> yes. Well, it absolutely has such a unique and distinct voice, and it's such a brilliant film. Congratulations on it. It comes out October 18th through IFC Films in New York and L.A., and please buy a ticket and tell your friends, too, so they can get it to Minnesota. Uh, and SAG-AFTRA, it is an honor to be here. Yes, thank you. Yes, truly. Thank you so much.